Okay, it is 1115. I can see that there are still some people trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Carrie Martin. I am the moderator for this session. The session is called The Heart of the Systems Librarian, and we have four presenters today. Shannon Pritting, who is the director of the SUNY Library Shared Services. We also have Kevin Mitch sorry Kevin, Mitchkey. Um, he is the Music and Systems Librarian at SUNY Fredonia. We also have Michelle Eichelberger. She is the Discovery and E-Resources Program Manager at SUNY Library Shared Services. And finally, Yvonne Kester. She is a Support Specialist at SUNY Library Shared Services. Um, welcome everybody. I will put some details in the chat as well, but um, if you have any questions for our presenters, please put them in the Q&A section. Feel free to use the chat to chat amongst yourselves. We're going to go to about 12 noon and then we'll leave time for uh, some Q&A. So um, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and I will let the presenters uh, begin. Also, if you want a more detailed bio, I'll provide the link in the chat for where you can look at the presenters um, fuller bios. Okay, go ahead. All right. So you can go ahead, Kevin. All right, so some of the topics we're going to talk about today are just uh, software as service and how um, things have changed in library technology. And then uh, reviewing the personality traits uh, for an effective systems librarian. Um, and then uh, looking at systems librarianship from you know, a non-systems librarian. I'm not sure if there is a prototype of a, uh, or an archetype of a systems librarian, but just looking at it from someone who does not um, consider um, themselves a systems librarian. And then the things that it takes to be, um, you know, a good uh, systems librarian and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, be, be successful in that role. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, so just a, a bit of an introduction in how I got into um, working in more of a systems role. Um, my background isn't necessarily in systems librarianship. I think I came to systems librarianship through um, a role that I'll talk about where um, being a combined director and systems librarian and then through access services, which is where uh, you know some systems librarians come, which is kind of a blend of public services and um, systems, and then, you know, previous in my career, um, reference instruction and public services as well. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. So some of the things that have been going on in the last four or five years in library systems, library technology, um, th there is a, a, a very fast shift to library software um, and just all software in general, not just library software, to be a software as a service and less um, downloading, maintaining, maintaining the connections between a desktop application and either a database that's locally hosted or hosted in the cloud. So it's more web-based application work. Um, so what, what this really means is that there are the systems librarian, especially if it's an independent systems librarian without an IT department in the library, that there's less need for um, kind of the harder IT systems management and more application or application development um, work. So it's more a high-end application user. And if you're going to do any of the uh, higher level IT work, that it's someone who has application development work. Um, and in doing this, this move to the cloud, there's um, also a move to systems that are more open for connecting into other systems. That's not to say that you couldn't do that um, in older systems that were desktop to a server or desktop to um, the cloud, but um, web-based systems are more contemporary and were developed more recently. So there is the ability to connect into the student information system. Um, authentication is much more important. Um, connecting out to other vendor systems so that you don't have to manually input orders from 
uh, another system, there's a lot more integration that can happen. And that's something that the systems librarian is often involved with um, as a liaison to either outside vendors or the IT staff who are managing those systems. And I think that takes uh, a, a, a lot of um, uh, diplomacy and being able to talk to other experts and specialists to say, this is what my system can do as a source or a target for your system. Here's what I need from you um, to try to make that person's life um, easier. Um, and, uh, you know, I was involved in a lot of this integration with Alma and those systems um, across a lot of the SUNY libraries. And that was the one thing that I usually found was most important is the IT person who had to help with that integration or the vendor who had to help with that integration, that they wanted to see someone who did his or her homework and presented what was needed from them and then they could fill in the gaps, um, which would require some surface level or maybe a little bit deeper than surface level understanding of this external system so that you could at least have a common language. Um, and, you know, in general, if you're going beyond integration, which is a direct one to one or, a, you know, a connection of pulling data um, out of or, or potentially just straight data into a system, um, the higher level systems work, um, that's typically done by someone who is in the IT department, or if you're a large enough library, someone who's in the IT department within your library. So this requires somebody with web application development skills to create custom middleware or writing scripts or applications that will manipulate data in and out of a system. And certainly we've helped with that, with, uh, with some of the uh, integrations, especially with the student information system where there was a high level of data manipulation needed to standardize um, th that information. Um, go ahead, uh, Kevin. So as the systems are more complex and connecting to more things, and you know, as more and more of library systems management isn't on configuring um, you know, circulation rules, et cetera, um, and more about digital um, content and linking. Um, the systems librarian doesn't just need to know the actual system that they're managing. They need to have a good firm understanding of the entire ecosystem that all of the you know that all of their systems live in that the system that they're that they're maintaining that that links out to a publisher system that has its own problems um, and uh, you know as you're looking at things like authentication why something isn't working that that's requiring that um, you know you, you do a fair amount of investigation of the entire ecosystem so you know being able to say is this an easy proxy issue is this an authentication issue um, is there something, you know, is there something uh, that is going on in between? And, and usually where I see that there are struggles or, you know, the difference between a very good systems librarianship task being performed and, and something where I'm typically involved in or someone from the, the library services staff um, is involved in is going through that thorough analysis to look at the different dependencies because to go to a vendor with a complex system, it's not enough to say this isn't working. Um, they're going to, in essence, tell you to go check these five things. And if you haven't done that already, then you're going to spend three or four weeks likely going back and forth, just troubleshooting the entire ecosystem. So, um, you know, more than just knowledge of the ecosystem, it's ability to critically troubleshoot the ecosystem, which requires some base level understanding, but also, you know, some creativity and, uh, and, and um, you know, persistence in troubleshooting as well. All right, you can go to the next slide, Kevin. So I'm really seeing a, a split and I think, uh, you know, just to try to articulate this as, uh, as uh, well as possible, um, the system librarians that I'm seeing, there's there's some that are focused and, and the vast majority are generalists. 
So what's often happening is, especially at smaller institutions, and, and really by smaller institutions, this now applies to campuses with FTEs of 7,500, 8,000. So smaller, you know, means still pretty big campuses. Um, so quite often what's happening is when a staff person leaves who is the systems um, manager or the systems librarian, um, his or her, uh, or their uh, duties get get assumed by other people, um, and especially e-resources duties often are are things that are um, uh, being connected into other people's duties as well, and and these are often um, staff who are public services, um, and uh, you know don't necessarily have a systems background either, and at the smaller campuses. Um, you know, those perhaps 5,000 FTE or below. The common theme that I'm seeing is that the director of the library becomes the systems librarian because, you know, it's kind of one of those things where um, responsibility travels uh, travels up the hierarchy, um, so to speak. Not that libraries are necessarily hierarchies, but, you know, that the director is the one who assumes this responsibility because there's no one else. Um, and that puts that person in a pretty um, tough role because systems librarianship often requires dedicated amounts of time to troubleshoot complex issues where this systems director is constantly stressed with systems work because they have so many other duties that are um, pulling, pulling for their time. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think this is something that I'm seeing more and more often and it will likely happen with higher and higher frequency um, as um, public higher education is going through a, um, a time of, of serious financial constraint and the systems positions and e-resources positions are the ones that we see the highest turnover, at least in um, the State University of New York system because there's more, um, there's more demand for their services at larger institutions that can offer a focused position for a higher pay rate. Um, this has happened over and over and over again. Um, so uh, th this I think is, has its positives as well. And you know, I think the transition goes relatively well for many of the librarians who are dedicated to becoming um, a good systems librarian because again, you're being an application expert. Um, so these librarians are used to being application focused. They might've used a content management system um, and uh, you know, they've used other applications. They know how to train people, um, <clears throat> et cetera. So um, I guess one of the positives and negatives is that often some of the public services staff um, they're not necessarily immersed in the practices such as cataloging and e-resource management. So, um, you know, we've tried in some of our training to layer in enough of that background um, conceptual knowledge and then focus on the application specific as well. Um, but I think that's just a general, um, you know, a, a point of, 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 of just learning for these type of, uh, of staff. Um, so another positive is that there's often a much more of a focus on usability and user, you know, user focus um, because that's really where their orientation would be if they're a reference or instruction librarian who's coming into um, systems uh, responsibilities um, because of retrenchment or not filling a position, et cetera. Um, so lots of good and bad coming out of that, but, you know, seeing definitely a, a shift more towards the generalist uh, uh, position. All right, go ahead, Kevin. All right, next slide, Kevin. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, so in addition to a staff without a systems background taking on um, a, a systems position, um, what is also a general trend is that the systems librarian is really becoming um, more of what I would see as an associate director role. Um, five or 10 years ago, it's now becoming a systems librarian who also is the data analyst, the trainer, the project manager. Um, so there's also, also, you know, kind of a combining of other positions for this system analyst because 
um, you know, the complexity of the systems involved and the data. So this requires someone who um, can work well with people, can handle complex projects, can look at data and work with subject matter experts to say, here's a report I created, here are the questions I have about the data, can you tell me whether this looks accurate, and then iterate on that report, um, etc. cetera. Um, and, and the thing that I think is, it has been kind of interesting to look at over the last couple of years as well, and I hadn't really seen this um, before the last three or four years, um, is that the systems librarian in, in, is typically the one who's coordinating training activities as well. So they might certainly work with people in a department, but they're the ones who are managing the, um, you know, the, the training program related to the library systems technology um, as well. And I think that's, you know, a good, a good thing, but there's also some work-life balance issues with that too, because of just, you know, more and more duties. And uh, go ahead, Kevin, next slide. And then um, the rise of the platform and we're using a library services platform, which can be frustrating in many ways in that it's extremely powerful, but it's complicated. And something that you know was simple in a standalone system now requires you to understand more of how the entire system works. Um, and um, this requires, this, this leads to a lot of frustration in, um, uh, having to do things that take a little bit longer than, than you know, a, a more simple system. And then also the maintenance of knowledge is, uh, is, is a lot because we're um, coming from systems that changed maybe every year, every three years, every five years um, to changing every single month or quarter um, with Alma and Primo and you know, lots of other systems are changing just as frequently. You can go to the next uh, slide, Kevin. So this has been one of the, one of the questions and discussions we've been having with uh, lots of our site visits and discussions with uh, campuses and systems librarians, who many of them are trying to um, merge what they have to manage um, into as few systems as possible. So these blended, blended systems positions are looking for fewer systems to maintain. Um, our, our, you know, typically vendors are layering on more premium applications in addition to the baseline applications so that you're managing fewer systems. So if you're managing e-reserves, um, that potentially you could do that in your platform versus another system. Um, and it's one of those things where um, there are some trade-offs in the platform can only be so specialized and there is a long community of practice with a lot of the well-established programs, um, but certainly not having to um, manage a desktop application and a whole other suite of, uh, of services is something that, you know, I think people who are practical and trying to um, do a lot with a, a little amount of time, that that's certainly an understandable position. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. And I'll just uh, end up with this, which is the 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 evolving role. Um, and sorry for the I thought I had fixed the typo here, but the evolving role of the systems librarian in the IT department. So increasingly, um, the systems librarian doesn't have programming experience, and the relationship that they have with IT. Um, is, is one that um, trying to put themselves on equal footing and get support for needed integration work and customizations that you, know, you need to make a, a, a case and you need to figure out how to get into their project plan. Um, and one of the things that I often see is the pain point is that librarians or, or, or libraries um, don't see necessarily the complexity of connecting enterprise system um, systems together and those limitations and then the need for planning and, and working at a strategic level with IT. And, you know, I would think this would be kind of at a director level often um, that, that would need to happen, the director and the CIO. And that's where, you know, we've had to help out a lot is to work with the systems librarian at that, at that library in the IT department to just say, you know, let's, let's figure out how we move forward in a way that everyone can support um, because, um, the the IT departments are stretched just as just as thin as the systems librarians are. 
All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Um, go ahead. Next slide, and that's over to you, Kevin. Thanks. I think there's a bit of a lag in the uh, screen share. I apologize for uh, uh, for that, uh, just to let you all know. So uh, hopefully this one is showing now. So, okay. I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of background because I am a, a initially and, and still a music librarian. My initial training was in violin performance and music theory. Uh, my uh, library degree and my master's in music history was from the University of Buffalo. I've been working as a music librarian at SUNY Fredonia for the past 25 years, almost 26 now, uh, but also as a systems librarian for the past five years and uh, now as an electronic resources librarian for for the past year since uh, we went go live. So we have from music to systems, or I, I should have really said music and systems because that's really what it is. And uh, just uh, the pictures on the left, they're, they're both lutes. The, the, the one on the left is the, a bowed lute, which is not as common. And then the one on the right is uh, a plectral or a plucked lute. A little bit of a large size one, but that's an interesting uh, icon there. And uh, those of you that recognize that computer in the background, I, I think uh, nothing really needs to be <laughs> said about that. But uh, the big question, uh, why the heck did I get decide to get involved with systems at Fredonia? Well, I'll go to Plato for my uh, uh, inspiration for the, the rest of the presentation. Necessity is the mother of invention, and I think uh, we can probably all agree with that. To give you a little bit of background how I ended up doing systems at Fredonia. Uh, through the 90s and mid 2000s, we had pretty much a full-time systems person. He, he was involved with uh, cataloging and other things as well, but uh, uh, I learned a lot from him just sort of, you know, by, by being in the same building with him, but uh, he retired. Uh, for a shorter period afterwards, we had a systems library, a little bit of uh, electronic resources management um, pulled in. Uh, uh, that person left for another position. And moving forward, this is a <laughs> common theme for a lot of us now. There was no hire for a vacant systems position. So around 2014, 2015, in consultation with uh, my director, I formally decided to add systems librarianship to my uh, existing duties. Then going on just a little bit, uh, there was a librarian hired for ERM, yay, but left for another position, unfortunately, before the end of migration. So at uh, Go Live, uh, it was basically just me. We were unable, again, to hire another librarian specifically for ERM. So soon thereafter, I merged ERM duties, which are related, but as you know, many of you know, uh, are, are actually oftentimes done by separate people, not, not always, but uh, certainly not in, in my case. I was, um, can everyone still see my screen? Because I, I, I okay, the, it just said my internet connection was unstable, so. Philosopher proclamations aside, I had to ask myself, would this actually work? And I still ponder these questions. Do I really have the time to be able to do this? Do I really have enough knowledge to be able to do this? And I think even more importantly, can I really have a few my favorite. I've uh, always been a computer nerd. If you read my bio, you'll you'll see that. Um, I was trying to uh, answer of people, but uh, pal, well, pals as well, <laughs> but uh, many of you know those systems. Um, I'm a photographer, so I uh, am self-taught in, in most uh, markup languages, HTML, CSS, and, and now getting in to uh, uh, XML and XML. Uh, my own is literally a geek, and so I 
every so while ask for, for something. A puzzle and a project, and I like to uh, follow it to its conclusion. So that's a good factor in my favor. Factors not in favor. No formal systems training coming more the norm now, uh, as is. And there's not large blocks of time available to develop those skills, as there are only so many hours in a day that one can work on things like that. My biggest challenge, time management, um, definitely. Uh, and <laughs> I hopeless desire for uh, blocks of uninterrupted time. And I'm sure many of you can relate to that. Uh, Shannon also mentioned this, keeping knowledge and skills current, uh, but not only with Al Alma Primo, but also uh, systems that relate to Alma. Uh, for example, Iliad, Banner, any other NIS system. Uh, and also, I have to keep an eye on local ITS systems practices. I don't necessarily have to know how to do them, but I need to know when to go to my ITS people uh, for what particular thing. Keeping up with the multitude of uh, resources from SLSS and Base Camp, the resources are fantastic. Um, sometimes the Ex Libris documentation, it's, it's great, but it's, it sometimes is overwhelming. And, uh, but there's still a lot of stuff to, to keep up with. And one other that, that you might not think about, but dealing with collegial expectations at my own campus vis-a-vis -vis systems in general, especially with uh, requests that, that need to be done rather quickly. And the reason for that is, is just simply that, that, you know, my colleagues don't necessarily know exactly what happens with some of these things or, or how long they take. And, and there's never any, any, you know, I'm not saying anything bad, about it, but uh, it is something that I have to deal with and I have to, it works into my overall time management um, segment. I think the benefits of uh, me doing systems at Fredonia have been uh, having someone available locally to manage Fredonia's uh, Alma Primo instance and also resources. Uh, I don't know if there are any campuses in the SUNY system where that is outsourced at all, uh, but uh, you know, fortunately for us, uh, uh, even though I'm, I'm certainly you know still learning many many things every day i i am doing fairly uh, a fairly decent job at managing things now uh the in-depth knowledge of all the back end stuff has uh allowed me to see the bigger picture much more clearly um i had uh, i just started doing virtual reference because i'm not i'm the music librarian but not uh i i do general reference sort of on the side and uh i was just uh, involved in virtual reference and there was a question the other day was uh, involved Primo, and it was like, hey, I know what's going on here, and it's because of my back uh, knowledge of, of the system. I'm able to help my Fredonia Library colleagues in ways that I wasn't able to help uh, when I was just the music librarian. Uh, and I'm working virtually with many new colleagues now in SUNY and learning a lot from their expertise. And uh, finally, for the benefits, systems work has really uh, spurred my interest uh, in learning more formally uh, different programming languages and things like that. Through And I'm uh, uh, working on a few online courses and certifications right now. Finally, yeah, I'll leave you with this. Some tips uh, and carry in, uh, things that I've learned uh, over the last few years. Most things, especially systems related things, invariably take longer to do than one thinks. Uh, I almost add uh, sometimes a, a, an exponential factor onto the amount of time I think it's going to take something to, uh, to, to happen. It doesn't always need to work out that way, but uh, I try to balance things a little bit uh, better that way. Um, if you're going to do uh, wear multiple hats, make sure that you have full support from your administration prior to agreeing to doing any of that. I've been very fortunate here at Fredonia. I've had very uh, good support uh, from the beginning 
uh, from uh, the library director. So uh, I've, uh, that's been not a problem for, for me at all. Take advantage of all the resources we have available. Basecamp, uh, your colleagues at, at your own institution, colleagues uh, throughout SUNY, documentation, or as my, my tech son says, the, the man pages. <laughs> and most importantly, and I, this was a hard one for me to learn, don't be afraid to say, I don't know how to do this. And don't be shy about asking for help from people who do. Thank you, and I'll turn things over to Michelle. Great, thanks Kevin. Hi everyone, thanks for attending our session. So I also do not have a background in systems before working in libraries. I have a BA in history um, and did a lot of temp work and different kinds of things before getting my library degree. Um, currently I am, as mentioned, the Discovery and E-Resources Program Manager for SLSS, but most of my background has been in community colleges and that's really the perspective that I'm taking in this presentation. So you can go ahead, Kevin. Great. So one of the things that we see fairly often is that um, you'll often see a search for a system librarian and then maybe three or four months later you'll see the call again because there was a failed search. It's a really challenging position to fill and there are many different reasons for that. Um, many people who are really more systems focused than library focused, they're not going to end up with jobs in the library field. The pay is not great compared to the, you know, the outside IT systems world. So it can be challenging to find people who have really strong system skills. Um, the job ads often ask for experience that you can't get in library school. So, you know, if you've been lucky enough to do some kind of an internship where you may have done some systems work, that's really great. But it can be really hard to find people who have the combination of the the library skills and the IT skills for your positions. Um, also the software that libraries use is really so specific to a library that it can be hard to get that specific experience from someplace else. The people who do have the experience usually want to stay at their own um, place where they are rather than start out at a new place, usually at the bottom of the pay scale, etc. So, you know, the, the people who are experienced are not going to want an entry level systems position at your library. The other thing that I've seen quite a bit, um, when I was at GCC, we had a lot of part-time uh, library staff usually coming from library school at UB or Syracuse, and they were really hesitant to apply for systems positions because they didn't think that they had the experience to be a systems librarian. Or again, the job ad said, you know, you have to have three years experience maintaining Alma or Alla for something like that. Um, and they didn't know how to market themselves to apply for something like that. So you can go ahead, Kevin. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today is that it's great, you know, if you have all of the specifics in the job ad and you can do all of the things that they're looking for, you know, maintain easy proxy or run reports in Alma or whatever, that's wonderful and you'll probably have a really good shot at the position, but it's good to also think outside the box. Um, you know, if you have experience in the world of social media, well, your library may need that and that's something that you could highlight if you were trying to apply for systems job. Um, you know, if you had a background in managing data or, you know, really strong organizational skills, that's something you could highlight. You know, a good systems librarian doesn't necessarily have hours and hours and hours of programming experience. You know, are you good with people? Can you communicate? You're often, often the liaison between the library people and the IT department. So, you know, are you good at forging those kinds of bonds? Uh, you know, can you clearly explain a problem so that both sides of the the issue the people can understand? And are you an independent learner? I mean, so much of what we have in the libraries, it's all new stuff coming all of the time. So you wouldn't have a background in it, but if you can pick things up quickly, or if you're curious and you wanna go out and learn new things, that's a really great asset for the position. So, and I just, I threw up a bunch of jobs I had before I got the job at FLCC in 1998. And I often think back and <laughs> think it's amazing that I got hired for that position. It, turned out great for me, but um, I really did not, you know, I was not a computer scientist. So you can really parlay a lot of your experience in your life into becoming a good systems librarian. So you can go ahead, Kevin. 
So keeping up is a huge challenge and this is true for anybody new to systems work but also anyone currently in systems work. Systems change so rapidly. I mean, everybody who went through the Alma Primo migration can see that and not just the, you know, the years of leading up to that, but everything that has already changed in the past year and the changes are coming even more rapidly. And this can be great because if there's a problem, it can be addressed quickly. It's a cloud based system. You know, the, there could be a new release in the next month that fixes your issue. But that also means that the pace of change is really speeding up. <clears throat> and you really have to keep up with what's happening every month. So that can be a real challenge. Um, I'm going to just take a moment here. Excuse me. Thanks for waiting for that. Um, so it's also really challenging to train new people. Um, having gone through this trying to train the person who replaced me at GCC, it's it's so hard to train on instincts. You know, you see a problem and in my head I think, okay, my spidey senses says this is why I think this is happening. But how do you train somebody that? That takes years to develop those skills. But on the flip side of that, you can develop skills that lead you to think that it's a problem caused in one area. But if you make that assumption, you might be missing where the problem is actually coming from. So it's a, it's not a very clear cut flow chart. If this, then that kind of a role, you really have to be open to all different possibilities of where the problems are coming from. You know, if you're, if you're watching Basecamp at all, you can see just weeks of flailing around. There'll be a question and, you know, often I'll put up an answer or what I think is an answer and it's not really the answer. So it's, it's a uh, it's a challenging thing, but also really exciting and fun. And you know, it's great to keep learning all of the time. So that's one of the things I really love about doing systems work is that you're never bored. You're definitely learning all of the time. Um, and even though the pace of change is speeding up, I think um, this has always been a problem. When I started at Finger Lakes in the late 90s, they had already migrated to Multilist, and to come into that world and have no background in that, how do you learn that system? And particularly that system because the under underlying programming was in French. <laughs> so it was, I can clearly remember calling up Olis and being, you know, saying, okay, <clears throat> are you guys offering any training on this? The training had already all happened. And, you know, John Schumacher said, well, what do you need to learn? And I said, everything. So, how, you know, what do you do if you come in after all the training has been done? And I think we are seeing that with Alma Primo as well, because the training was so intensive. And what do you do with somebody who comes in now and they missed a year and a half? So <clears throat> it is a challenge, but also has many good points as well. So you can go ahead, Kevin. So these are just, you know, some skills that I think are really helpful to have. Um, be a tenacious researcher. Your library skills are actually more important than your system skills when you're dealing with systems because the beautiful thing about the library world and particularly SUNY, I just cannot stress this enough, having worked at a different library system and then coming back to SUNY, SUNY is amazing for sharing ideas. People do not take a proprietary stand on that. You see this all the time, you know, somebody will put up some code that they've used to make something work. They will post it in Basecamp so other people can use it and share it. It's SUNY is amazing for sharing information. Everybody else is in the same boat and a lot of our students are shared students. So do your research, you know, ask for help. As Kevin said, don't be afraid to admit that you don't know how to fix something. Most of us don't know how to fix things day in and day out. And the only way you can learn is by asking other people or doing your researcher. Um, and so this, my second point speaks to the same thing. We're all doing the same thing. And with Alma, we're all using the same system. So ask your colleagues for help. People And people get a kick. I mean, we're librarians. We're supposed to be excited about helping people. So, you know, this is a reference question. Your colleague at Fredonia has a question and you can help them. And then next week you'll have a question and they'll be able to help you. So I think libraries are amazing. And I really love being part of that. Um, you will often learn more from failure. And I know this is, you know, people say this all the time and it sometimes makes me roll my eyes, but really you're not going to learn until you failed a couple times. That will help you understand how the system works. Hopefully it's not a failure that impacts other people too much, but expect to fail and learn from your failures. And that, you know, that's what builds your breadth of knowledge so that two years from now, when you see this same issue happening, you can think back and think, oh yeah, you know, I saw this happen in another place and another time and this is what I think is going on and you wouldn't know that unless you had experienced that failure or that problem in the past. Keep an open mind. I know this is something I struggle with. I'll see something and I think I know what the answer is and I'll charge ahead down that path but I haven't really thought about all of the different 
things that could be impacting it. So, you know, it's good, even though you have some experience to keep an open mind and think about, you know, be open to other ways, whatever you're looking at could be broken. And don't take it personally. I struggle this month with myself. Um, you know, it's really frustrating when you can't get things to work the way you want them to work. But just remember that everybody's in the same boat and we are all in this together. So I think that's it for me and we're going to turn it over to Yvonne. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hi, everybody. I'm joining you today from Albany, New York, an area originally inhabited by the Algonquian Indian tribes. Okay, Kevin. Okay. Before I begin, I would like to dedicate this presentation to Catherine A. Frederick, who was the systems librarian at Skidmore College from 2008 to 2016. I always said she'd be a good woman to have around in an apocalypse, and I wish she was around now. Today, I will be speaking on this topic as a bit of an outsider because I'm not, an inside, I'm not a systems librarian, although I have served in that capacity twice. The first being when Catherine left Skidmore suddenly in the fall of 2016, and the second at SUNY New Paltz when Christy Lee took on her temporary role as LSP project manager with OLIS in 2018. But I have worked at three very different libraries doing IT and systems work, and I wish to share some of what I've learned from these experiences. Okay, Kevin. Oh, um, no, go back. Thanks. Um, I landed a job with the at, at the Gilderland Public Library, a fairly large library outside of Albany, in the summer of 2008, after two and a half years serving as their reference clerk. As the reference clerk, I had moved the statistics keeping from an unwieldy paper-based system to an Excel workbook that could be edited by more than one person at the same time. I also edited the library web pages, and probably most significantly, I worked with the Capital District Library Council on their digitization project in 2007 and 2008. Through this work, I had shown myself to, to be an adept user of technology and was offered a job in IT. Soon after this, it was clear to me that the IT world, back Kevin, please, <laughs> thanks. Soon after this, it was clear to me that the IT world was far removed from my humanist sensibilities, very exacting, very literal, very yes, no. But I dug in as, as best as I could and began building my knowledge. This was truly an IT shop and not, a, and not systems work the library systems were maintained by the Upper Hudson Library System. So the knowledge I was acquiring was of the nuts and bolts variety, keeping computers maintained and secure, setting up Wi-Fi networks, setting up projectors and sound systems for programs, and so on. But I also spent a lot of time learning new technologies, such as digital readers and digital microphone scanners, and then writing detailed instructions on their use. As an experienced user, writing these instructions, I learned that I took certain aspects of using technology for granted, and I needed to put myself in the place of a person who is least experienced, least able to navigate and transfer knowledge gained from one technology to the other. At GPL, this person was an Italian grandmother named Isabella. So with Isabella in mind, I broke down every process in the minutest detail, using as few words as possible and lots of screenshots. Okay, Kevin. Most people want to use technology for a certain purpose. And when they seek information on how to use a device or system, they are looking for specific instructions on how to accomplish their task. This is something I believe is good to keep in mind, even when talking about a system as complex as Alma, or maybe especially then, because most people are overwhelmed with information, both at work and in their private lives, and are not interested in learning the whys and wherefores. They want to know how to do their jobs. A good part of the systems librarian's work is to distill dense corporate documentation into easily accessible step-by-step how-tos. When Catherine hired me as the systems analyst at Skidmore College in 2011, it was as much because of my background in English and my experience editing for a small academic publisher as it was for my tech experience. She was halfway to her six-year review, not tenure, but a similar process, and she needed someone to help her write documentation 
for what became a five or six inch thick systems manual. She spearheaded the project and I wrote probably a third of it under her, under her guidance. We used to joke that if she ever got hit by a bus, I would be able to pick that monster up and do her job. In 2016, when Catherine left Skidmore, I actually had to do that. And this manual was invaluable. I could not have functioned without it. I cannot stress enough how important clear, concise, up-to-date documentation is. Okay, Kevin. One of the surprising and somewhat disconcerting things I encountered when I started technology work was the power people accorded me as a techie. Almost immediately, my colleagues in other departments of the library began treating me with a sort of awe and respect, as if I had some magical powers they didn't or couldn't have. Granted, technology is a discipline and it requires a lot of often painfully acquired knowledge. But to be honest, much of the time when you're called in to solve a problem, the most basic rote learned items in your toolkit will suffice. Okay, Kevin. What we do may seem like magic to non-systems people, but I've always been wary of this. It may be tempting to allow people the illusion out of a desire for job security or just out and out status, but I've always maintained that anyone who is interested in doing this work can do it. Most processes, other than writing code perhaps, take time to learn, but once learned become straightforward, especially if you write down how you finally figured out how to do them. When anyone shows interest in learning how to do something I'd normally and happily do for them, I show them how it's done. It is good to empower people this way, and it falls in line with the core responsibility of libraries. Give a person a fish, they eat for a day, teach a person to fish, and they can feed themselves for a lifetime, or until another system is implemented. Okay, Kevin. Systems work is stressful, and it can come at you like a storm at times. You get going from one thing to another in rapid su succession, and it can be hard to slow down and actually read an email asking for help. You could see a few words and jump to a conclusion about what a person is asking, and in consequence, totally miss the clues that they are giving you. Okay, Kevin. Slow down, listen, read. And if the email doesn't make sense, do a reference inf interview. This can be done by email, but it's so much better to talk on the phone or even better yet, meet with a person and have them show you what they mean. Okay, Kevin. This point holds also in the other direction. <clears throat> when you are asking for help from Ex Libris or OCLC or any other vendor, remember that they too are inundated with requests and it serves them and you much better to be very clear and to the point. With Ex Libris, I have found that using a screencast software such as TextMyth's Capture which will record up to five minutes of you talking and showing your com computer screen, goes a long way toward making your problem clear and helping support to help you. Okay, Kevin. The last and greatest lesson I have learned has to do with people, not systems. As a systems librarian, you work in the interstices between machines and humans. Technology with its constant changes that often seem arbitrary and unnecessary to its users, intimidates and often alienates people. It is very easy to say that people should get with the program or get left behind, but we should remember that, that humans build systems to serve humans, not the other way around. When we leave people behind, what have we accomplished? In my opinion, the best thing I ever did at New Paltz, with permission of Mark Colson, the library dean, was to move my workspace from the tech office on the main floor to an unoccupied cubicle on the lower east side where I joined ILL, acquisitions, tech services, and e-resources slash serials. I was also near to the bathrooms so everybody had to pass my desk several times a day. It put me in easy access, oh I made this move three days before we went live with Alma and it put me in easy access of most of the people who would be using Alma heavily. The weeks and months that followed were like running a gauntlet, but people felt free to drop by and ask for help anytime. So this is my last piece of advice. Make yourself available to people.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for an excellent presentation. Um, now we are moving to our Q&A section. Um, so what I'm going to do is we have three questions. Shannon did answer one of them live, but I'll um, read it aloud um, in a moment. I'm going to address Christine's question first. And uh, for the sake of the recording, I'll read it out loud. I have had the opportunity to do some systems work over the last year, and it seems to suit me. I have yet to start a second master's, and I am torn as to what direction to go. Does anyone have any suggestions? For what type of degree to explore that, or what types of certifications to pursue? Um, I, you know, fr from my perspective, you know, unless you have a background, you know, I think, I think a lot of people might, might, you know, generally tend towards, um, you know, something that would be more, more, more on the IT side, but, you know, I think unless you've, um, you know, as far as the second master's, unless you have that, you know, that, that bachelor's degree background, that that's a really tough, um, move. Um, I think, you know, it, it could be something where you could get some professional development in some of the areas of IT and then, you know, potentially an MBA for a second master's would be a really good, um, uh, you know, a really good step. And especially, um, I think a lot of good MBAs and there's a lot that are within SUNY as well, which uh, focus on IT management, because I think systems librarians aren't necessarily um, the ones who are going to do all the work, but they do need to be very good at managing systems and projects. Um, but that's my perspective. So others um, feel free. I would just add uh, to that to do, <laughs> do something that you love. Uh, and that would probably uh, impact what you do, uh, you know, as a systems person. I mean, uh, my second master's was in music, obviously, because that's what I did as an undergraduate. But uh, uh, I, I agree with Shannon. I don't think it necessarily has to be IT heavy. Yeah, I would, I would also suggest looking at a, a community college nearby and see what kinds of courses they're offering. And I think, you know, so, so, so Liz is asking a good question too, of like, you know, that there is a plethora of IT skills or, or things that you could, could learn. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I, I would, I would say focus on the general areas first and, and Angela is saying, you know, like there's the, the community college, um, web design would be a, a good one. Um, but always think about two of, um, you know, how much in those areas that you can go into in your current systems position. So, you know, do you want to get as deep into developing middleware? Um, is that something that your own IT, that your own IT department would even support? Um, or do you need to build those relationships? So I think what I've seen a lot is that, um, you know, that the uh, IT ecosystem at that at that individual campus, um, you know, isn't necessarily going to support someone doing a variety of things. And that's, you know, that's certainly something to think about as well is like, how, how does your own learning apply to the situation if that's what you want it to do? I would completely agree with that, Shannon. And I would just say that, you know, for Liz's question, she asked specifically about JavaScript, CSS, XML. I would look at things like CSS or HTML because those can be used in so many different ways and it really helps with troubleshooting. But something like JavaScript, you can go for a long time with just knowing how to copy and paste JavaScript. So if you don't really have the need to be developing new specialized JavaScript apps or programs that might be lower on the list. I mean, any knowledge you gain is useful, but I would start with the more general things first. I agree with Michelle on the JavaScript. I'm I'm a great one for uh, copying and editing for uh, local purposes, but uh, I I don't do it from scratch. That's for sure. 
And I would say too, a really great opportunity, I think for professional development, um, especially, especially in, um, in, in campuses where, you know, you have, if, if you have a, a faculty position um, is, you know, just serve on the IT related, um, the IT related uh, committees, et cetera. And I think that also solves another problem, which is that you get better working relationships with a variety of levels of IT. And I think they always appreciate the different faculty, but not teaching faculty perspective. Um, and you know, you, you, you'll learn a lot more about your own ecosystem by doing that. Um, I've heard a lot of good things from people working in those areas too. Well, I have to say the beauty of having seasoned presenters when you're the moderator is that they um, are easily transitioned to the Q&A list. And everybody's questions that we've had in the Q&A are all very similar. Um, but I wanted to read out Jill's. Um, does anyone have any recommendations for resources, professional development training, anything really that will give a systems librarian more of a knowledge base regarding some of the stuff that's more on the IT side? And some of you have spoken to some of that. But she also says, I feel like that's a gap I have when I troubleshoot. And I'm wondering if any others feel the same. I think many of us feel the same, Jill. Um, panelists, if you uh, presenters, if you have any additional comments to make on this, go ahead. I would say, um, you know, give yourself time and this stuff, it takes a long time to, to build up experience and don't be afraid to go to your IT and you certainly should try your best to create a good relationship with IT so that um, they can help you walk through these things at times. And I would say some of the, one of the best presentations I've seen on this subject um, was about two years ago at the SLC by uh, Holly Heller Ross, who is the CIO. And uh, I don't know if she's on this present uh, on the uh, uh, um, attendee. And she was talking about how to build good relationships with IT departments. And I know I'm going a little off question here, Jill, but um, one of the things that um, she talked a lot about is that um, what an IT department really wants is sort of an acknowledgement of um, application specialist versus IT specialists. So I think that's something that, you know, perhaps just working with your IT department and saying, I want to learn more, I'm curious, um, and, and getting kind of more of a, a good working relationship with them. Um, would be would solve perhaps some of those problems of just being able to go to them and say, I'm, I, you know, I'm running through this here is what I'm trying to do. Um, can you give me any help from the authentication perspective, etc. Um, and, and, you know, I think, depending on what your goals are is like, do you want to go work for uh, an ARL library and be kind of in the IT side of the systems librarianship? If so, you know, go go to the ones that are kind of the IT certifications in those areas. Otherwise, I think maybe just building relationships with IT. Yeah, I would definitely, yeah. I'll, I'll just comment briefly on that tangent. I, I definitely here at Fredonia, uh, I've been very fortunate to uh, build some great relationships with uh, IT and uh, I understand a lot more about what they do and, and uh, sometimes why it takes a particular amount of time to do uh, different things. So um, as far as uh, I, I've found very helpful, uh, especially learning XML and XSL, uh, there's a, a w3schools.com, I think. Uh, it's a very structured, um, that's where I learned a lot of my uh, HTML and CSS coding and things like that. And they have a WYSIWYG editor. I know that doesn't work really well with uh, XML, but uh, you know, some of the, the skills, you know, in markup languages you can get from, and it's a very, very well organized and very well structured uh, online resource. Okay, um, that seems to be all of our questions, but I did want to just bring attention to Rebecca's question as well that Shannon answered. Um, do you know if there's been any studies done among folks who do systems work and what the breakdown is of everyone's backgrounds? 
I'd be curious to see that. I always figured more of us came from cataloging tech services than public service public and access services. I myself am from more public access services, but from ILL as well. And Shannon responded, hi, Rebecca, great question. I've seen a few studies that are tracking this trend. I don't have the citations at my fingers though. So um, at some point, uh, I'm sure Shannon will try to get back to you uh, on that. But we are at time. And um, I'm gonna thank the presenters again, Shannon, Kevin, Michelle, and Yvonne for this presentation. I think your slides are now gonna become my Bible. It's uh, really, really helpful stuff. Um, so thank you very much. And um, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, it's time for lunch. Thanks everybody.